I, sorry, I was on mute. All right, everybody. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Cost of Jacked Up or KJ. I'm uh, the Director of Product Marketing here at SafeReach. I wanted to thank everyone uh, for taking the time to attend our inter interactive session today on such short notice. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all the registrants and attendees after the webinar is over. If you do have any questions about the product, about the webinar, or the content just you know just discussed in general or general in general safe breach, please feel free to uh, ask those questions via the Q and A uh, option available on on Zoom webinar. Uh, we shall be answering all questions live during the Q and A session. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so essentially, as everyone knows, news broke on August 10th uh, that Cisco, one of the largest enterprises uh, in, in the world, confirmed that they had actually been breached. Uh, according to the details that were initially shared, they were targeted by a nation state APT group uh, who had been in their systems approximately since May 2022. Uh, Cisco did the right thing. They immediately raised the flag and shared the details of uh, their internal investigations along with the IOCs and TTPs with the wider security community. Obviously, they did that in order to ensure that nobody else gets uh, uh, faces the same issue that they do, and they're able to appropriately uh, take countermeasures. Today's informational webinar is intended to share how this attack actually unfolded and how you, um, as an enterprise or an organization, can proactively protect yourselves against uh, some of these breach methods used during the Cisco attack, whether you're a safe breach customer or not. Our speakers today, uh, jumping on the speakers, our speakers today have extensive security background and are very well known in uh, the security community. So today's webinar will actually be jointly presented by Itse Kotler, our co-founder and chief technology officer, and Yotam Ben Ezra, who's our chief product officer. Itse and Yotam, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, KJ. Um, as KJ mentioned, today's presentation is thanks to Cisco Talus blog post. We are able to take this information and kind of walk you through. I do want to take a minute to acknowledge Cisco for doing the right thing by coming forth with this information and share it with the community. Thanks to them, we can now have foundation to rely our simulations on the data as well as do other activities with those IOCs and TTPs. It's important to mention in today's presentation, we're not going to go and beat Cisco for being hacked. This is not about how this has happened to Cisco. This presentation is about understanding what companies are facing these days and what is the right thing that they can do given that this is the threat landscape. So as KJ mentioned, as we mentioned in Cisco blog post as well, Cisco has been targeted by what seems to be the Russians, according to different attribution that are exist and been correlated by Cisco Talus, namely the Z account that we'll get to it later that was created. But it is very obvious that they've managed to infiltrate into Cisco and they've managed to create some kind of an impact. At least three gigabytes of data has been confirmed that has been stolen from Cisco. To this point, it's not yet understood what this data could be contained. Of course, after SolarWinds, we all very much been aware to supply chain attack. And I think this case is no stranger to that impact as well. Could be any backdoors left, could be any compromise in products or framework. What, what is the nature of the information that has been stolen and whether that could be used to assist adversaries to maybe find exploits in Cisco products? All of this is still to be determined. But what's sure right now is that Cisco has confirmed the date that they've understood that there is the initial access has been gained and all the IOCs and TTPs that was observed as a result of it. And with that being said, let's look into the details itself. In many of the cases, we are talking to the security industry about the different types of infiltration. Previously, when we had the log4j, that was the nature of a vulnerability. We had a CVE and we scan our assets for that. Here, there is a different story. Today, we're not going to talk about the particular CVE or a weakness in any product. Unfortunately, we're going to talk about a story that we all know and cherish in the information security, which is social engineering. 
time after time it's been communicated and clear that social engineering can go through different technologies, processes, and boundaries and still be successful. And this is also the reason why many of us in the industry have decided and are deciding to look at the security problem from a horizontal point of view. Some of us are using the cyber kill chain methodology, others are calling it defense in depth. The MITRE attack is also taking a stab at this problem, trying to basically create the different steps. So again, as we all recognize that infiltration has multiple ways in this story, we can see that a Cisco employee was targeted. And matter of fact, the attack was happening on his personal Gmail account first. Again, outside the boundaries of the corporation, yet still an employee of the company. Now, again, we're not going to go over and talk about how this problem can be prevented. We're all working toward education, training, and awareness. But it is important to recognize that there are different initial attack vectors. Some of them are CVE driven, others are not. But when we look at the kill chain from an holistic perspective, we have to recognize that infiltration is almost given. And this is just one more example that shows how social engineering can be used to meet some of the commercial realities of today's solution. In this unfortunate incident, we can see there is a rhetoric about how the employee was almost arrested to the degree where there was an MFA fatigue. By using different techniques, they were able to get and bypass the multi-factor authentication that was indeed in place to prevent unauthorized access. So as you can see here in this very simplified chain, coming from the employee personal Gmail, accessing the credentials stored in the browser, moving forward to achieving the MFA uh, approval all the way through the VPN, that was how the confirmation was for the initial vector. And upon completing this process, the adversary found themselves within the Cisco network. So as we said, there, was, there is a commercial reality to all security solutions, whether it's process related, human related or technology related. And that's why we cannot rely on a single point of security to prevent those attacks. It's always a defense in depth. It's always about spreading the kill chain. And we as the vendors, we as the, the, the defenders can use those different choke points, those different points within the attack to implement our security controls. As you can see, the MFA was in fact a security control for the VPN. Unfortunately, through this harassment and MFA fatigue, the, um, in this case, the adversary did manage to get the approval, did manage to get the access to actually bypass it. And as we're talking um, more and more about dissecting this attack, and we'll go into some of the details in a few minutes, it's very apparent that, again, understanding those steps, understanding that they are going to be repeated in future attacks, kind of give us a point of leverage, of data, that we can then test those things. We should not be surprised by them, of course, nobody expects to get hacked or nobody expects those to be uh, found on their environments. But understanding the template here is what kind of gives us the assurance that testing for it has a benefit. And so let's begin with the first thing that uh, Cisco has published across what the adversary has done, and that's the post compromise. So the adversary already gained access to a footprint, to a machine, and now the adversary wants to do two main elements. One is to maintain persistent access, essentially making sure that they can come back to that endpoint in the future if they've been covered um, or being detected. And of course, also to leverage the information on those endpoints to further lateral move within the company, right? Not always the adversary is going to quote unquote land on the right assets, they need to lateral move. And again, while they need to lateral move to get to the crown jewels, for us, the defender, it's another insight into the process. It's another potential mechanism that we can design security controls to either detect or mitigate this. The first example that we see here is the usage of PowerShell. And many have said this before, and I will say it again right now, 
If you are not using PowerShell in your company, if PowerShell is not part of your administrative tasks or technology stacks, monitoring for PowerShell, the usage of PowerShell by itself could be a great indicator of an attack. And again, the reason why adversaries are using PowerShells or at large living off the way of the land is for them to avoid bringing their own tools. Bringing their own tools into compromised endpoints is essentially risking their exposure. They have to download something that will then go to the company's web gateway and other security controls. And that by itself can be an indicator. So as you will see during this presentation, the adversary has managed to leverage as many things leading off the way of the land. In addition, we will see an example that the adversary tried to bring legitimate software to create remote access. Um, okay, Joe, we'll just go one slide back, please, just so I can finish. So the first thing that the adversary tries to do is obviously going for the NTDS to understand exactly what is he or she is looking for. And again, this would give them the, the most wide overview and understanding. Also know that right now we're working in a windows related environment. So this is right now focused on the, net, the network, the Windows network portion of, of Cisco. Mo moving on, we can see that the adversary has created a series of commands and notoriously creating the Z user. So um, this was actually used by Cisco Talis as a point of reference that apparently the Z account is somewhat of a signature that has been used by these adversaries that has been attributes again to Russia in the past. So creating a local admin user named Z is a backdooring technique, one that does not require to create any new type of software, but one that once the adversary is not of its location and existing, can then use to back RDP back to that machine or gain any other remote control using that local account. So as we can see, that was one of the first persistence techniques that was used by the adversary is to create a local admin. Second of all, we can see that the adversary to ensure their persistent access to the machine has actually went ahead and even used a legitimate software such as LogMeIn and TeamViewer and perhaps even others to basically ensure that he or she will have access to that machine in the future. Again, that's a very smart thing to do. It's smart from two perspectives. One is that the LogMeIn software and TeamViewer or any other legitimate software like VNC, for, for instance, is not something that will be flagged by anti-malware and EDR solutions. We're talking about a software that has been used by enterprise on almost daily basis for anything from IT troubleshooting to basically facilitating remote working from home. So by bringing a legitimate software that is whitelisted and is approved by many enterprises, that would not create any indicators of compromise. Again, for us, the defender, the message here is very clear. There are two interesting elements in this MSI exit command. First of all, I'd like to draw your attention that the MSI was actually in the folder called pictures. Imagine how many times have you actually ran an executable from a folder called pictures. Obviously, this is a very interesting threat hunting and also adversarial simulation technique, right? Running executables from folders that normally should not be the one where you have executables. The second thing is obviously you and the company has your own rules and policies. If you do not use technology or software such as TeamViewer or LogMeIn, this is obviously a red flag for you, right? If an employee, either by an inside threat or just a human error, end up deploying a remote access software such as any one of those, this is something that you should be aware of. Again, if it's part of the company stack, and this is definitely a very normal operation, but then again, if that's part of the company stack, perhaps it's already pre-installed or been installed by a trusted script. Over here, we can see that the user decides just one day to install this software, again, from a strange folders such as pictures. Again, something for us to consider and think of as we're both doing threat hunting and adversarial simulation. 
Last but not least, again, we're seeing more evidence of the adversary trying to dump passwords and dump registry in order to gain more information about the assets. These are all part of the discovering information collection. Again, these by themselves could be part of a backup routine or maintenance scripts. But again, we do need to keep in mind when are these commands are being executed? For what purpose? At what time? I mean, does it make sense for all of our users to run these commands? Um, does it make for them? Does it make sense for them to run them every time, every day? Again, these signals are in hindsight right now, as Cisco has obviously published the information for us to consume and analyze. But this is definitely signals that has been seen in other events. And when are being cross-referenced with frameworks such as MITRE ATT&CK, there are examples, unfortunately, for almost every one of those indicators of compromise here. Again, just to reiterate the message, adversaries do have to use innovation, but they also go with the path of less resistance. If these techniques work outside of the box, they would use them, but they never know if these techniques would work or not. When they're hacking into your company, when they're trying to penetrate your environment, they're coming to your playground. And you can use this knowledge, you can simulate those attacks to make sure that you have the proper detection and mitigation if you choose so, so you won't be surprised. Moving on with the post compromise here, we're looking that the adversary actually decided to cover their track. Now, again, this is not anything new here. But it is important to understand that, for instance, clearing the logs, and again, I'm, I'm making a point here to say it's a plural, it's the logs, meaning that they couldn't just cherry pick the events that they created. They end up clearing the logs. And I think this is also by itself a very interesting perspective to consider. I mean, how many times logs are just disappearing from machines without any further explanation? And I think that's a very interesting, again, use case here to simulate and understand what will happen the day somebody, he or she will conduct those actions on the computer within your company, whether you have the right mechanisms to have an insight into such events that happen. And again, as we can see over and over, the adversary is trying to use different types of software and techniques to get as much information as possible from the machine. And why would they do that? Because they need to lateral move within the company. As we said, when the employee was the victim, it's unclear right now what was the employee job within Cisco, what type of access he or she had has to. And therefore it's safe to assume that there has to be at least a couple of more hops in the middle for the adversary to get into something that perhaps can be valuable to them. Again, at this point in time, we're not sure what they were looking for, but we can only assume, and again, Cisco being a big network manufacturing equipment company, that anything from compromising their software to stealing the source code and anything in between could be imposed a threat both to Cisco itself as well as to Cisco customers. So as we can see time over time, adversaries are trying to let you move. They're trying to dump information and use this information, techniques such as pass the hash and others to basically gain further footprint within the compromised network. There are more techniques that has been logged in that has shown that the adversary had a lot of persistency and attempts to persistent on the machines. And again, that's a very interesting insight to understand because as the adversary from one hand did, did a job of wiping the different logs to try to hide the activity, the adversary must also consider the possibility that he or she will be detected at some point in time. Therefore, they wanted to find a way back to that asset in order to make sure that they can regain footprint on a particular machines. And so over here, we can see how they've tried to do a different wind logon bypass techniques to maintain that privilege escalation. Again, within the detecting of the attack, the, the post-compromise that we are observing right now, it has been confirmed that there was an exfiltration of data from Cisco. 
Unfortunately, we did have shared, Cisco Talus did share the IP addresses and the URLs, but specifics about how exactly which protocols and which techniques were used were not reported here. So we can only imagine the different types of ideas that the adversary might have used, anything from DNS tunneling to HTTP smuggling. Again, it opens a complete array of ideas that companies can right now test themselves against. Remember, at each point in time of the compromise, while well, infiltration was given in this case, lateral movement was something that could have been potentially detected and mitigated, as well as exfiltration by itself as well. So as we're slicing and dicing this attack using the kill chain methodology or the MITRE attack, it's important to separate the different impacts and simulate the different impacts. If Cisco, for instance, or any other company out there could have prevented a data exfiltration, it wouldn't make the breach as escalated or as sense of urgency as a data breach. It still would have been a bad day and definitely an event to be recognized of, but mitigating the attack or killing the attack at different points does mean that the damage control and does mean in some cases regulation wise a different treatment. And as again, as we're seeing time over time, there's an evidence that the adversaries were trying to target other employees. There is an evidence that the adversary will try to brute force different machines to further gain the footprint within the network, all which makes sense essentially as an adversary perspective. If this was not targeted toward a specific product or person, we can see here a pattern that the adversary tries to spread further and further within the organization in an attempt to find more sensitive data in an attempt to access more sensitive services. So we say Bridge, a leading vendor in the bridge and attack simulation space, is obviously looking at this breach as an indication that there is a reuse of the adversary playbook here. And as I mentioned before, some of these techniques were already mentioned in the MITRE attack. And there is unfortunately past examples that reiterate those modus of operandi. And so today in SaveBridge, our customers already had different behavioral MITRE attack driven simulations that were answering some of the behavioral that was matching here. Again, when we talk about behavioral simulation, we're not talking about the specifics, for instance, the account Z here. We're talking about adding a local administrator as a concept. So today, when you're thinking to yourself, will I be able to detect or mitigate the creation of a new local administrator? This is something that our customers could already simulate and test even before the Cisco incident. Having said that, we obviously can't ignore and won't ignore the actual technicalities and the payloads that were delivered as part of the Cisco Talus blog post. In our response to that, we created a new set of simulations that are IUC driven, which means we're not just testing for the behavioral, but the actual payload as was the one that described in the attack. So when you're asking yourself the questions around your security control that are not behavioral, ones that are based on signatures or sandboxing capabilities, if you're asking yourself, will I be able to detect those payloads if it would happen to me? Those sets of simulations has been delivered to exactly answer that question. And as you can see, there's a variety of different attack methods here. Anything from email to drop to disk, to C2 communication, that should trigger an array of variety of different security controls, all helping you to address the question of how safe are you from this threat. Yutam, let's move to you. Yeah, so thanks, Itzik. Uh, very interesting. Um, and so what, what I wanna uh, quickly go through is, um, first of all, what does it take uh, uh, for a safe bridge customer, safe bridge user, uh, to actually run this uh, uh, scenario uh, related to that bridge in their platform today, um, and then also 
uh, what we're offering to customers and prospects as part of supporting the effort uh, of, uh, of, of understanding where you are with regards to this, uh, uh, to this bridge. Uh, and then quickly go through a demo. Um, so uh, to start, uh, the attacks that uh, Itzik mentioned, uh, both the behavioral uh, side of the attacks and also the uh, uh, IOC part, uh, were all curated in a scenario. Uh, uh, in the platform, and they are basically pre-packaged uh, uh, and can be seen uh, 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 on the scenarios uh, part of the uh, application. Um, uh, going into that will allow you to, to um, decide where you want to test uh, this in your network. And of course, uh, uh, several organizations have uh, uh, very uh, uh, wide networks and uh, there may be variations in configurations, in security controls, in policies between different uh, segments in the network. And so our recommendation is to cover as much as possible to get the most uh, uh, granularity in understanding where there may be gaps and where you are uh, uh, safe and uh, basically protected. Um, uh, once uh, uh, this has been configured and run, and uh, I will try to show in my demo how this is done, uh, there are basically two areas where you can analyze your uh, uh, preparedness. Uh, the first one is a known attack series report. So it's a pre-canned report which basically <coughs> takes the different parts associated with the attack and uh, gives you a high level understanding of where you are from a risk standpoint. So. Uh, across the infiltration, uh, propagation, host actions, and the outbound uh, communications, and uh, potential data theft methods associated with that, uh, where uh, the focus might be. The other is uh, uh, several options uh, uh, on the dashboard side, which can help also drill down into the details and understand uh, the exact uh, areas attribute the security controls associated with uh, um, uh, prevention, detection, and alerting for uh, 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 methods associated here uh, or tested, and also understand where in the organization uh, there may be gaps or vulnerabilities. Uh, so I'll try to take you through that very quickly in a demo, but before that, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, how you can leverage that as a customer and then also if you're not a safe bridge customer. So basically what we understand is that several safe bridge customers are at several uh, levels of deployment across their environment and possibly in some cases there might be a motivation uh, to increase the coverage for this specific uh, 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 bridge as this is um, uh, Top of mind, several customers we've spoken spoken to during the last few days are very interested in basically understanding that to the granular level. And so uh, what we decided to do is basically to offer customers uh, a completely free unlimited license until the end of this month for uh, testing the uh, uh, that specific uh, uh, Cisco bridge. So we are uh, going to assist you in deploying as many simulators as you like uh, in order to get the visibility and coverage that you are after uh, uh, in order to support uh, the effort of uh, gaining visibility towards that. Um, another aspect of the offering is that uh, uh, the Safe Reach as a safe uh, service part, managed service, uh, which basically can help uh, uh, either uh, in the deployment part, in uh, the configuration part, in uh, planning the attacks part, and then in creating the dashboard and advising or remediation is also accessible at no additional cost uh, today uh, uh, until the end of the month. Um, so basically the thinking here is that uh, um, uh, during this time where there is something uh, of this magnitude happening, we uh, want to step up and help customers um, uh, get as much as they can. And uh, uh, we are uh, willing to support that uh, with uh, basically the capabilities that we can offer. Um, so the question comes is, uh, uh, what happens if I'm not a separate customer? And if you are on this webinar today, uh, basically, uh, we invite you to sign up for the assessment of the Cisco scenario through a free offering that we already offer customers. So we have a free offering, which is called the ransomware assessment. And uh, uh, predominantly, it is used for assessing ransomware attack. And what we've done here is essentially uh, uh, added the uh, this bridge scenario 
uh, to uh, our ransomware assessment offering. So if you are a SafeBridge non-customer and you are interested in evaluating your effectiveness versus this uh, specific breach, you can utilize and sign up for the ransomware assessment service and uh, mention that you are after a, a, a Cisco related breach. And uh, what we will be able to provide is both training, uh, the assessment itself. So uh, it starts with uh, explaining how the attack works, then actually running the assessment in the environment, creating the scenarios and producing a custom report for you uh, for the findings and recommendations. Um, so save rich non-customers we uh, invite you to sign up and uh, utilize this at no cost no strings attached um, so from here i want to go to a quick demo and uh, talk about how uh, it looks like in the platform uh, so thanks kj for allowing me to share i will just share my demo screen um, uh, can you confirm that you can see it, KJ, just to make sure that everyone sees? Okay, excellent. So uh, I started exactly in uh, uh, the attack section in SafeBridge uh, scenarios. And as you can see, there is a latest known threat scenario, which is recommended here. You will also find it as part of the uh, uh, known attacks category. And uh, uh, in order to uh, see what's inside, we will go into the scenario. There is a description of the threat. Uh, there is a breakdown of minor techniques associated with it as well but the interesting part is to go to the scenario uh, uh, configuration and as we can see the scenario is already broken down to the different steps uh, the infiltration propagation around the ioc types which can help validate uh, security controls uh, against all of the artifacts which were uh, uh, exposed as part uh, of the breach and make sure that signatures are actually preventing them both uh, at the perimeter of the network and also uh, uh, at the, uh, uh, the different segments so both on the segmentation side and also on the perimeter um, then the post -explo exploitation part uh, the first part is uh, uh, around behaviors so we have both uh, the system information dumping behaviors uh, around credentials and then the different uh, configuration changes which were done either to achieve persistence or to uh, uh, weaken defenses. Uh, and then the second part of these host level scenarios are around uh, the IOCs as well for validating endpoint protections at various stages of loading the actual malicious play, uh, uh, payloads into, um, uh, uh, into the machine and um, lastly uh, c2 communication both with real c2s that are associated with this breach or with a simulated c2 what using the uh, patterns which were used and then um, uh, data theft uh, methods which uh, are uh, the more likely ones uh, associated with this breach uh, so there was mention of uh, uh, various uh, 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 options around http exfiltration and then also internally in the network, uh, there was a uh, file transfers around SMB. Uh, so this is the description of the entire scenario. Uh, what does it take to run it? Um, uh, so I'll take here the easy path uh, and I'll go to all my simulators in my network. I will mark them and let the SafeBridge system basically decide uh, what's the right attack to test where, and that's it. Um, basically what I can do now is uh, just run a test uh, directly here. Uh, the test will run all of the possible permutations across the different simulators. Of course, I can uh, uh, decide which simulators I want to select for each step separately, but of course, uh, it can be very simple. And as you can see, the different uh, uh, parts of the uh, scenario will create high uh, uh, different permutations in terms of what simulations we want. So this is it. This is what it takes to run it. I can, of course, run it on a scheduled basis or I can save it for later and run it on a maintenance window and, and, and then uh, possibly take some action and then uh, run it again to validate that uh, uh, whatever gaps I may have found uh, have been actually addressed. Uh, so this is the operational part. And then the question is, OK, we ran it. So what? Uh, and so there are two quick things I want to show. First one is the dashboard. Um, so uh, I can go to a dashboard here, which uh, uh, is a dashboard we prepared for a threat analysis. In this case, I'm looking at that exact uh, test here. I can get a high level summary of my overall results. 
uh, the number of different uh, attacks that I ran, the number of techniques that I've tested, and the overall simulations, which is almost 4,000 simulations across the different permutations in my demo environment. Breakdown by platforms, by different business units, if I want. Very easy to see here where which business unit is the problematic one in my demo. Uh, but as I go down, I can uh, uh, also get a breakdown by uh, TTPs and IOCs and basically uh, drill down in each and every part here. And as you can see, we already have attribution of what was logged, what was detected, what was possibly prevented by control. Uh, but I can also look at it from the kill chain perspective. So in each part here, uh, uh, the initial access, uh, I can see a breakdown to the different parts of my environment and then a breakdown to the different attacks that were tested. And I can see here in my cloud dev environment, I had some preventions, but I had some things which I should probably want to look at, which uh, I have visibility, but they weren't blocked. Uh, and those are the real malwares getting into the uh, environment. On the propagation side, again, I can see a breakdown. I can see the gaps very clearly here uh, uh, as well. It's the IOCs which are being propagated across different segments in my network. And then the different host actions, again, tested on different host uh, uh, systems with different protections and uh, uh, different, uh, different results. And for each of those, I can drill in and see so we can Maybe look at the uh, uh, one which was prevented, the, the ones which were prevented, just to sort of get into the uh, details. In this case, it's a, a pre execution loading to memory of that, uh, uh, of that uh, uh, ransomware. Uh, and I can get all the explanation and parameters. I can see that the simulation was blocked. We saw a security action which was prevented and also an alert. And in this case, it was a, a, a Microsoft protection which generated that, and I also have the alert. So I can go all the way down to understanding exactly uh, what was uh, the tool that prevented it or detected it, or where do I have logs for it. Um, again, the host actions, the behavior, uh, behavioral parts, I can uh, uh, get the same, uh, the same type of breakdown. And then also for the C2 communication, in this case, I'm doing pretty well on the C2. Um, and then uh, the data theft methods. Um, uh, uh, the, the last part is also uh, lists of IOCs for remediation. So we can see we have a, a, a few uh, hashes, some ports, which we should look at, some protocols, some commands, and some uh, uh, attack details to look at from an IOC standpoint. Okay, so this was the first one, uh, dashboard, which is really helpful to basically dissect the attack uh, versus where we are with regards to this attack as an organization. Um, the second one is uh, the report, which is worth looking at, and that is the known attack series report. So if you want to share that report uh, with, the, um, uh, with the, sorry, with the, um, um, outside the, uh, the, the, the actual group or with an executive, uh, we have a summarized report, which exports well to a PDF. The dashboard can also be exported, but this is sort of more high level breaks down the same different stages uh, of the attack and gives me evaluation of my risk at each of the levels of the attack. So as you've seen before in the C2 communication, I was okay. Post actions, I had some problems and in the others, I'm somewhere in the middle and I can see this breakdown uh, 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 also in a little bit more detail in the report. Um, Right, so I think uh, this is what I had to show. Hopefully it helps understand, first of all, how to run the scenario in the system, uh, and then also uh, the different ways in which we can look at the, 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 the results. And uh, happy to uh, move to some questions if we have them. So much your time. We get back into presentation mode. All right, everyone. So uh, now we have uh, some time for uh, questions. If you have any, uh, please use the uh, Q&A function in Zoom webinar to share your uh, questions. We do have a few that we received uh, over the course of the webinar. So I'll, I'll go ahead and get started with those while uh, people type uh, other questions. First question that we have is, how can BAS uh, or breach attack simulation help with triaging uh, when faced with an emerging threat like uh, this attack? So I'll take that one. Um, it, 
basically part of the, 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 the basis of uh, the way we operate is that we are able to um, um, integrate with both the security controls um, and the SIM uh, uh, platforms and the operational platforms and essentially uh, after the after the fact after the attack uh, query their API and ask them what do you have for this time of day for this uh, area in the network with these artifacts and basically bring in any uh, uh, logs events detections alerts that are associated with uh, 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 with the attack that we have uh, simulated or performed and so it helps understand the different stages of the uh, protection chain basically. Um, and attribute exactly uh, uh, where I have logs as a, as, a, as a protector, where I have logs, where I have events, and uh, uh, is my SOC level uh, detection with alerting also um, uh, also works. So um, um, uh, basically it, uh, it helps triage and to make sure that the protections are, uh, are uh, well configured. And if there are, first of all, gaps, but also opportunities. So in some places, maybe I'll have some logging or some uh, 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 detection, but no uh, alerting or uh, no prevention, maybe with some changes which are relatively easy, I can improve my security posture. So um, I think this uh, sums it up. Thank you, Yotam. Um, here's another question. Are real payloads using these attack simulations? Yeah, I'll take this question. Uh, it's a great question. The, the answer is yes. So we believe that in spite of an uh, adversarial simulation in the BAS product, there should be two categories of types of simulations, one of which are more behavioral, which obviously the actual payload is not the purpose here. The purpose is to create an action and to make sure this action is being either detected or mitigated. And again, going back to the example of the Z account. So today the adversary creates an account in Z, tomorrow it can be a Y, Right, we're not looking for the letter, we're looking for the behavioral itself. So this is the top type of our behavioral simulation. In addition, and because there is publishment of the actual IOCs and the payloads, it would be a shame not to simulate them themselves. Again, those were the actual payloads that were used and reported by Cisco Talus. And so for attacks that do have payloads in them, we have embedded the actual malware. So we can think about anything from your EDR to sandboxing solution, anything that should inspect, look at the hash, or maybe even simulate or execute, excuse me, in a closed environment such as sandboxing, all of them will have the appropriate trigger so you can then test yourself whether those payloads could have been bypassing or getting into your premises. So yes, it's yes to both. There's a follow-up question for that. Um, does the program uh, recommend which containment action should be taken once the simulations are run? So I'll take this one. Um, Yes, so not only that, we also um, uh, scale down the problem. So uh, what we do is basically after we uh, finish the simulations, uh, we are able to analyze the results, uh, identify common containment actions or remediation uh, uh, suggestions, which are associated with groups of uh, uh, simulations of similar uh, techniques. And then uh, it helps us both prioritize those radiation insights, but also create data packages which are actionable uh, based on those. Uh, those could be Sigma rules, it could be uh, uh, queries that uh, will work uh, with the same, it could be uh, um, uh, exports of uh, different IOCs associated with those uh, uh, attacks uh, and so on. So each type of technique will have its uh, uh, data package associated with that. Uh, but the answer is definitely yes. Here. Uh, the last question that we have that we've received so far is uh, how long does it take uh, to test against uh, a threat like this? We saw a lot of attacks listed there. How long would it take to uh, test against the Cisco breach or other such critical threats? Yeah, so every attack uh, or every simulation takes seconds. Uh, and so even running a very large number of simulations uh, uh, and assessing that at the network wide scale is not a matter of uh, days or weeks. So for example, uh, in our uh, demo environment, it's quite an extensive demo environment. 
we had a, a, about 4,000 simulations, almost 4,000. I think we saw that in the demo about uh, 3,700 and something. And that took less than two hours to execute across the entire uh, infrastructure. Um, so the answer is it depends on the size of the environment, but it's very fast compared to testing it manually or something of that nature. All right, sorry, uh, that is about the questions that we've received. Uh, if at any given point of time, if you have any additional questions about uh, the offering, about the threat, please feel free to use the uh, contact us form on our website on safebreach.com. We'll be more than happy to reach out to you and uh, answer all your questions and uh, queries. So once again, uh, from all of us here, thank you so much for taking the time on such short notice to attend our webinar. We really appreciate it. And we are looking forward to helping you in any way, uh, shape or form. Thank you and have a wonderful day.